So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Federico Olgado, lead UX developer at MailChimp. Thanks, Federico. A few years ago, can you guys hear me? A few years ago, um, I read a book that really changed the way that I design and think about software. This book is called Refabricating Architecture. And the point of the book was to compare four industries. These four industries that the book is comparing was the architecture, the, building con the architecture industry with the automotive, the shipbuilding industry, and the aerospace industry. And the reason why this book compares those industries is because the architecture industry has not really changed much in the last 80 years in comparison to the automotive or the shipbuilding industries. And uh, there's, th there's a reason why that's happened, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. For example, this is the Tesla Model S. This is a car that effectively came out of nowhere. This is a car that does 0 to 60 in 4.2 seconds, and it has a, mile, has a range of 300 miles, but the catch is that it's an electric car. Uh, Tesla showed us, showed the world that the, the electric car is viable today, and this is amazing. This didn't come, with, this didn't come from BMW, Mercedes-Benz. This came from a, just a, a new player. Um, Another industry, the shipbuilding industry, has also made some really incredible improvements over the last few years. Um, what you see here are the Oasis of the Seas and the Allure of the Seas. These are the two largest passenger ships in the world right now. And they can transport 5,300 um, passengers and 2,300 crew members. And they can do that by feeding them, entertaining them, all in style, moving at 26 miles an hour. These, th these things are gigantic. I'm sure you guys have seen one of these up close before. Not, it's really breathtaking. These things are massive. They're incredible machines. On the other hand, architecture has really not changed in the last 80 years. Architecture right now, still to this day, is ruled by gravity. And what that means is that things that happen at the base of the building must be completed before things that happen closer to the top of the building can take place. And this actually has hindered architecture, and it's, it's basically forced it into this project process that's very rigid, very linear, and single-threaded. And that makes it slow and expensive and hard, very hard to manage. But you may be asking, what does architecture, what does the, what does the auto industry, what does the shipbuilding industry have to do with software? But in reality, what that means is that the projects that we work on today are actually comparable in complexity and scale as to building a cruise liner or building a building. You know, these projects are scoped in months and years, take millions of dollars, and very highly skilled uh, group of people to actually finish. So earlier this year, we started the process of redesigning MailChimp. MailChimp um, is a pretty big app, and there's a few things that really overlap with some of the theories that I write about with the auto industry and the shipbuilding industry and how they change to improve. And these, some of these theories are things that we actually had a chance to implement and, and to use because we were, we were at the point where we could have a fresh start. This was our fresh start for the next generation of the application. So just to give you an idea, uh, new MailChimp took about six months from the time we started uh, sketching and thinking about it until the time it launched. Um, it, this was an all-hands-on-deck project for our company. All of our developers, all of our UX developers, all of our UI designers, plus two back-end developers were uh, strictly focused on this project. And it was also a high-stakes project because it's not something that you can take lightly when three and a half million people use your application. To, to the, and it really depends, they, they depend on us for their business. Um, and after we redesigned, it took three rapid releases uh, post-launch to actually refine it and stabilize the application at, uh, so that we could get it to the place where we actually felt comfortable with it. And really, uh, you may think this is kind of funny, but our barometer for success initially with the redesign, was that we did not have mass mutiny. We were so worried that our users were going to revolt against us. 
we were worried that people were going to hate this and they were going to stop using MailChimp because it was such a drastic change. But what ended up happening was that people got used to the new MailChimp and were able to jump in and do the things that they needed to do without it affecting their business and without it affecting the way that they do things. And you may say, how can we make these redesigns, these things that are so expensive, they're so fragile, and they're so dangerous. I mean, they have such high failure rates. How can we survive this redesign? And how can we make it so that after the redesign, we're in a better place than when we started? And in order to answer that question, um, we can actually answer that by answering this other seemingly unrelated, but actually very applicable question, which is, what's wrong with architecture today? This quote describes at a very high level the state of affairs in the architectural industry. And it reads, the traditional building paradigm is to gather all the parts of the building on site and then assemble them piece by piece. Does this sound familiar to you guys? It sure did when I read it for the first time. It kind of hit me in the chest. I was like, man. And for an architect to actually start building a building and for the process to take place, uh, an architect has to put together a drawing, these very com complicated drawings that have to satisfy legal requirements, they have to satisfy accessibility requirements, and they have to satisfy the requirements of the, of the user, right? Again, it sounds very much like, some, like the things we do as designers and the developers building software. But the reality is, is that until that architect is done with those drawings, the foundation can't be poured. Until the foundation is, pure, is poured and it's verified and, and we're sure that it actually meets the specifications, the structure of the building can't start taking place. And don't even think about the interior finishes of the building. You can see how linear and rigid this process is. You cannot start on the interior of the building until the foundation's poured and until the rest of it, even the plumbing and everything else has taken place. And this has affected architecture. It means that it's slow, it's expensive. But on the other hand, how has the automotive industry been revolutionized? The automotive industry has effectively become an assembler of parts, an assembler of components. Back in the day, Henry Ford pioneered the assembly line. And what that meant was that back in the day, a car had approximately 500 to 1,000 parts, and a person would put each part on the car as it went through the assembly line. But in the modern day, the modern car manufacturer actually assembles about 50 fully built components onto the car instead of those six to 10,000 pieces that a modern car has on average. And what that allows them to do is that allows them to multi-thread and actually develop these other products like the door mirror or the engine or the wheels or the brakes in separate and in parallel. It allows people that actually focus on those things to specialize in building a wheel or building a, a braking system. And it's revolutionized the industry. These guys have gone from about a 60 month time to market to, and this was 20 years ago, to uh, 12 months and shrinking. So in 12 months, uh, a car company can actually start designing, building, and shipping a car, which is actually really amazing. But you may say, you're cheating. You're comparing something, the scale of a building, to a car. You know, it's like, the, the scale doesn't add up. But in reality, the shipbuilding has also adapted the shipbuilding industry has also adapted uh, in a similar fashion, and these guys are actually building things that are bigger than these buildings, right? A cruise ship like the one we saw is definitely way bigger than this hotel that we're standing in. And the way they've done that is the same thing by modularizing their components. They actually brought the manufacturing of these ships indoors to improve working conditions. And the cranes and the infrastructure that they use to move these parts have also adopt, uh, adapted. A crane can actually move this piece, which may be five or six stories high, and assemble it onto a partly finished cruise ship, just like a Lego block. It's really, really amazing. So you may say, what can we learn about the things that the auto and chip building industry have done to improve and to change over time, and how can we apply that to our own industry? Well, when we started redesigning MailChimp, uh, we started by thinking in a modular manner, right? Uh, and we started trying to build a system, and this system was comprised of, of parts starting at the smallest possible level. These parts actually created and assembled 
put together these components. And these components are actually some of the core parts of our, uh, of our user interface. Once you assemble these components, you end up with a fully working page. And um, that fully working page is, they all feel the same, they all look the same. And the reason why they all feel and look the same is because they all share the same underlying architecture. And that underlying architecture that they share is the culmination of our redesign. And that, and the, and that culmination is what we call the pattern library. If you guys want to check it out at some point, uh, you can go to ux.mailchimp.com slash patterns. And it's actually publicly available for you to see. Um, <laughs> great. So our pattern library is comprised of atomic level elements and ready to use components that our designers and developers can use to build front ends. For example, this is, uh, this is our slat system. This took us about a month, a month and a half to design and engineer for the first time. And we started the redesign process by actually looking at the most highly trafficked page in, pages in our app. Those pages were our four main dashboards, of course. And we needed a way to show the information in those four main dashboards in a way that felt cohesive, but was also kind of uh, scalable and adaptable so that they could fill those different roles. And after designing it and after thinking about it, we actually went through a ton of different iterations on how we could make this happen. We arrived at this SLAT system. Again, about a month, month and a half from the time we started thinking about it until we, the time we um, we finished designing this and building this and implementing it actually for the first time. But something happened after we built these initial slats that was really, really interesting. We found that this slat system was making its way onto what I like to call the dark corners of MailChimp. Um, our application has over 600 different views, 600 different pages, and if you count some of the partials and some of the includes, it, it goes to more like 1,000. It's a mess. There's a lot of crap in there, right? And like I said, I, I started finding these, and these were making, they're making their way onto these dark corners of the app. And you're like, you know, this is why? You know, what's happening? So, for example, we, we're working on a new feature. This is going to come out in a couple weeks. Um, the slat in the middle is the members export slat. And this is something, this basically just shows you where you've exported something in our app. Um, this slat, uh, if you look on the left, you'll see um, our campaigns dashboard. And this, like I said, this is by far the number one page in our app after the dashboard, which is the page that you actually land on once you log in. This is the most highly trafficked page in our app on the left. And on the right is the mobile version of this, this members export dashboard, which is something that we foresee that only probably one to 2% of our users will actually use. Because not a lot of people export things out of MailChimp, but the ones that do export things, they do it a lot, they use it all the time. What ended up happening is something kind of magical. We ended up putting so much time and effort into this initial design that when we went and reused it somewhere else, this page now doesn't feel like a dark corner of the app anymore. It doesn't feel like the redheaded stepchild that was neglected and just a regular old table that nobody was going to really care about, nobody was going to use. But instead, at, even at the mobile level, which is now where you're, you're starting to get into the details of things, it's actually, it's functioning, it's, it's workable, and it has the same level of usability and polish that one of our main dashboard uh, views have. And really, that's only one of the examples of the rest of the things that we were actually able to modularize in the application. The slats are only the beginning. We're able to modularize our popovers, our tables, our forms, everything in such a way where the code was share, shared and we were able to start getting these marginal gains when we reused uh, components of the application. But, you know, it's funny because I still remember working in the old ways, right? This is, this is what MailChimp used to look like. And every time we built a feature, every time we designed something, there was new code, new CSS, new, new markup. And as much, as much as we tried to get them to feel cohesive and look the same, we got there to some extent, but they were never ever actually, never ever felt like a family. And the reason why was because the underlying architecture was the same. And this gets, this problem gets exacerbated even more when you have multiple designers and multiple developers actually working on the same thing. But I have to tell you, this process 
it's not for everybody, right? This is not gonna make sense for a two-page site or a two-page application. It will make sense when, you're, when your app has 600 views or 1,000 views, right? But it was a very, very high cost of entry because it took us, I would estimate it took us two months of very heavy prototyping, sketching, and thinking about how this would work in order to get started. And it turns out that all those initial things, a lot of those initial things and ideas that we had, they got tossed. You know, they're no longer using the app. But another beautiful thing about it is, is that some of the ideas and some of the things that we actually use and actually made it have been getting iterated on over and over and over and over again. Those last mobile views that I showed you, those only came about a couple months ago after the app being live for uh, three months. We, one of the things that we wanted to do when we launched MailChimp, new MailChimp, was only to focus on the mobile views for tablets. We didn't even want to look at the phone yet because it's such a different experience. And that allowed us to go back after the fact and refine some of those things. Here's another example of a system that we came up with to, uh, to make sure that the age-old problem of the comp doesn't look like the finished product doesn't happen to us anymore. You know, that when you're working in such close quarters with a team, you want to build trust, right? You want to make sure that the things that the visual designers are doing, it doesn't feel like it's a waste of time. So we established this system of vertical rhythm so that when a designer is building something, they know how many lines, basically we have a unit, which is six pixels, how many units of space there are in between. And we also implemented this system in code so that the designers and the developers don't have an excuse, right? You can't say, uh, I, you know, I, I couldn't really figure out, I wasn't sure what the spacing was because it's easy. It's one unit, two units, three units, and the system is established and it works. And we found that by following this system, now everything looks more cohesive and everything looks more like the comp than we originally got. To wrap it up, um, MailChimp, again, the redesign process got us to a point where things are a little bit more cohesive now, right? Uh, and the reason why they're more, co more cohesive and the reason why all the pages in our application now feel the same, it's because they actually share the same underlying infrastructure. To put it a little bit in perspective, it takes about six to eight months to build a single family home, um, a, a traditional single family home in today's day and age. And it took us about the same time, six to eight months, to rebuild an application that serves three and a half million people that they depend, that they depend on to get their work done. Um, so I think that to put it all together, if we look at what the car industry, what the shipbuilding industry has been moving towards, which is this concept of modularity, I think we're moving in the right direction. And I urge you guys, if it makes sense to you, to actually explore the concept of patterns and systems. Like I said, um, our patterns are actually publicly available, so please, please go check them out. And another thing that we do is uh, we, uh, we're actually writing about um, our UX experiences bi-weekly. Um, and you'll find a sign-up link to our newsletter in our pattern library. So please go check it out. Thank you very much.